Hello and welcome to Library Land. My name is Candace Brenner. I'm here with Barbara Meyer and we are from Golden West College where we have a science museum. In the science museum we have a lot of live animals as well as some taxidermy mounts and other displays that rotate and change every semester. This is Icarus. Icarus is heavy. <laughs> she weighs about 43 pounds and she's about eight and a half feet long. She's a Colombian red-tailed boa constrictor and she's probably about 12 years old. Now, the reason she's sticking her tongue out is to smell. That's how snakes smell. People smell by getting chemicals into their nose and that gives them the sensation of what's going on. But a snake will pick up chemicals in the air with its tongue and <coughs> touch it to the roof of her mouth where she's got a sense organ that detects the smell. Uh, Icarus is from South America or Central America or even a little bit into Mexico. She, uh, you can tell by her color that she is camouflaged very well. If she were hanging in a tree, you wouldn't be able to see her very well. And that's what she does to hide. That way, if an animal walks underneath her that she wants to eat, she just falls down on it and eats it. <laughs> the way that a constrictor catches its prey is to bite it and then wrap around it. That way, each time the animal exhales, she wraps a little tighter and the animal can't breathe and it dies. And then she eats it. Now, snakes can unhinge their jaws. We open our mouths this way, but a snake goes like that. Okay, so it can swallow something that's a lot larger than you might think. This snake eats rats. She can eat maybe a rat or two every week. Uh, she probably could eat a rabbit with no problem or a possum or things like that. However, we don't give that to her. Uh, if you look at her scales, you can see maybe from there, I'm not sure, that the top scales are pretty small. But on her stomach, the scales are quite long. <laughs> she's not easy to move around. Okay, these longer scales help her to grip the road when she's crawling so that she doesn't slip. That's one way that they can get around. Icarus is a mother. She's had snakes, had babies twice since we've had her. Each time she's had about 20 babies. Most snakes lay eggs, but the constrictors have live babies. They're about a foot long when they're born, and they start eating right away. Um, we don't have the male anymore because he was too mean and was biting people, so she hasn't had babies for quite a while now. Okay, uh, let's put her back and move along here. Put that in the tail first, which is a task in itself. The reason I got the snake out first is because I don't want to smell like something warm and furry. If I were to handle the ferret and then handle the snake, I might smell like lunch and the snake might try to eat me. And that's not good. Oops. This is Scampi. Scampi is a European ferret. Let me put him on the table so you can see how he moves. This is a domestic animal. They've been domesticated since about the fourth century BC when the Romans were domesticating them and using them to catch rabbits and birds. Uh, since that time, they think they are descended from the European polecat, although they're not sure but this is strictly a domestic animal. They are not found in the wild. In North America, we do have a ferret that looks quite similar to this. It's called the black-footed ferret. Now, that ferret is very endangered. In fact, they thought it was extinct, but a few years ago, they found a colony of about 25 of them around North Dakota. They won't say where because they want to protect them, which is smart. In California, the laws are pretty strict about what kind of animals you can keep. This kind of animal is illegal to keep as a pet in California unless you have a special permit from the Department of Fish and Game. In order to get that permit, we had to have her spayed. The reason is because they're considered a threat to the native animals. If they were to get out, they're very good hunters, and they would be catching the rats and squirrels and rabbits and things that live around here, and that could deplete those populations. So for that reason, and since our climate is so mild, a lot of animals are not allowed to be kept as pets. These are related to the weasel and the river otter and the skunk and the badger and the mink. 
very playful animal, very friendly. They can be very sociable if they're raised since they're little and handled a lot. You get him to run a little bit. Sometimes he runs sideways, he does somersaults, he does all kinds of strange things. Some animals have masks like this to help protect their eyes. If an animal is in a fight with another animal, the animals often try to attack each other's eyes and disable them. When they have a mask through their eyes, it makes it harder to see the eyes, and that way it helps protect the eyes of the animal. Now this animal you can see is very long, very streamlined, has very short legs. These are well designed for burrowing. Okay, they go into holes and they track the rabbits and the mice and catch animals that way. Also, their ears are very small and that helps to keep them from getting dirt in their ears when they're going down the tunnels. These are very inquisitive. Sometimes their fur is used, but not too often, fortunately. The family they're in is the Mustilidae family, like the skunk. These have an odor, although they don't squirt it like a skunk. Usually when you have them spayed or neutered, you'll have their scent gland removed. If you don't, they're pretty musky smelling. But they are quite an amusing pet. A lot of states do allow you to keep them as pets. Okay, let's move along here. We have another ferret too at the school. It's an albino. It's very old. It's had a stroke and it's a little bit blind, so we don't travel with her too much anymore. But their lifespan is about for about five or six years. <laughs> Let me help here. This is Apollo. <laughs> Apollo is an umbrella cockatoo. There's quite a few different kinds of cockatoos. They're from Australia and Indonesia and around that area. This kind is mostly white, but he does have some yellow color on his wings. You can see his wings are trimmed. We cut the feathers on the wings and that keeps the bird from flying away. When we travel with our animals, we have to do that as a precaution. And a lot of times if you get a new animal, you'll want to do that to train them. But it's painless. It's like cutting a fingernail and the wings will grow back. This bird is a male. It's real hard to tell with a lot of birds whether it's a male or a female. But you can tell with the cockatoo because if it's eye color, the male has a very dark, dark colored eye. The female has a reddish brown eye. So this one is a male. He's full grown. He's about a year and a half old now. He's quite friendly. This is a very friendly type of parrot. They're easier to tame than some of them. Okay, to get these birds, they catch them in Indonesia or wherever, and they bring them into this country, and they have to keep them in quarantine for about a month. Now this bird has a ring on his leg. That means that he's been in quarantine. This is very important because some birds can bring in diseases such as the Newcastle's disease that can affect the uh, poultry industry, for instance, and wipe them out. So they have to be very carefully regulated. There is quite a bird smuggling business and a lot of money to be made in it, but a good proportion of the birds, well over half of them, will die in transport that way. Plus, it can deplete the natural populations and it can cause them to become endangered. Uh, in Australia, in Sydney, some of the cockatoos have started eating the houses. <laughs> they're uh, chewing up the wood shingles and the woodwork around the windows. And because they're somewhat protected, the people really can't do anything. They put up scarecrows and they put on um, gels to repel them and it's not working. The insurance companies won't repay them because they say cockatoo attacks are an act of God. <laughs> so it's kind of a problem. However, this guy is a very nice pet. Usually your cockatoo will be a little bit more brilliant white. This one's kind of a dirty white because he's so popular with all the students. They pet him and kiss him all the time and get him dirty. Okay, we'll go on to the next bird. This is Copa. Copa is a blue and gold macaw. Now, I brought this bird to show you what can happen if an uh, animal is not treated properly. We just got him about two weeks ago, and he's pretty much a mess. He's been malnourished. This is a hand-raised baby. A lot of times your parrots are taken away from their parents and raised um, by hand and fed by hand 
And that's really a good way to get a very tame pet. However, they have to be fed properly. This one was malnourished. Because of that, he's had a calcium deficiency. Now, his wings don't move at all. These are frozen into place, probably because he's had multiple fractures because his bones were too soft. Also, he can't walk very well. I'll put him down so you can see. He has to kind of think to use his legs properly. He's had a little bit of neurological damage because of his bad diet, too. So his brain doesn't function completely right. It's kind of like if he had polio. However, he's very friendly, and he talks, and he's happy. He's not in pain. So we're working on getting him in the best health possible. He'll never be totally healthy, but he will be healthy enough that he'll be able to survive. These parrots can be taught to talk, but not all of them will. Copa can say, Copa, and I love you, and hello. He likes to scream hello, and he can laugh like a maniac. However, he won't do it on cue. He likes to do it when people are ignoring him, and he wants attention. We have quite a few taxidermy mounts in the museum, such as this pelican and the bobcat, the coyote. We never go out and kill animals for this. These, all of these animals were hit by cars, and I may have a chance to talk a little more about them later. This is Bullseye. Bullseye is a possum. He's not quite full grown yet. Um, we got him as a small baby. The reason we call him Bullseye is because he had a hole right between his eyes when we got him. It was quite large. It's pretty much healed up. And you can't see it too well anymore. But it lasted for several months. Um, the vet really didn't know what caused it except possibly a fall. Now, possums are marsupials. They're related to the kangaroo. These animals are born after the mother's only been pregnant for about 12 days. Then they crawl up into the pouch and they attach to a nipple there. They can raise, they can be, there can be 12 to 13 babies in the pouch and they'll stay in there for about 100 days. After that time they'll come out of the pouch and they will crawl around and hang on to the mother's back. They can stay with her for up to a year. Usually they don't stay quite that long. Now you can imagine with that many babies clinging to her that they can fall off once in a while, and they do. This one was found by some kids in my neighborhood who brought him to me, and we raised him. We fed him baby food, Gerber's baby foods, such as uh, chicken and um, vegetables. These are omnivores. That means that they eat both meat and vegetables and fruit and anything they can get a hold of. That's why they survive so well in your neighborhood. Probably a lot of you have seen these crawling on your fence or dead on the freeway. They're very common in this area. They um, like to eat your cat food, and they like to get into your garbage. OK, these guys are pretty harmless, though. The only way they're going to give you trouble is if, you have your, if your animal corners them or something. Then they'll fight. But if you leave them alone, they pretty much leave you alone. They are um, usually not considered to, cause, to carry rabies. And they are not really a danger in any way. Possums have a tail, which is prehensile. That means that they can hang on with it. Let's see if I can get them to do that. He's clinging to me with all these words. OK, can you see that? He can just hang on with his tail, just like a monkey. And you wouldn't want to try this with your dog or cat, because it would really hurt him. Now also, you can see here that he's got thumbs on his back feet. This is the only non-monkey type animal, non-primate, to have a thumb. It makes him a very efficient climber. Possums are nocturnal. That means that they're active at night. They'll sleep during the day, and they'll roam around at night. Now, these little beady eyes don't have real great vision. They uh, have very large whiskers, and they can feel their way around quite well with that. And their hearing is pretty good. They also have very soft fur, and that is often used in um, collars of ladies' coats and things like that. Some people eat them, too, especially in the South, not so much around here. They say they're pretty tasty, a little greasy, maybe. I prefer not to myself. Possums have more teeth than any other animal. I don't know if you can see his fangs here, but they have about four more teeth than any other mammal. 
They also tend to drool constantly. You can see his nose is about to drip there. <laughs> He's nervous. They drool. Usually he uh, opens his mouth and slobbers all the time. They are an incredibly stupid animal. I'm sorry, but you are. <laughs> they um, don't really seem to have any personality at, as all, at all. And as a baby, I really have never seen one play. I certainly wouldn't recommend one as a pet because they have no personality and they're kind of dirty. But they're pretty innocuous. They don't bother us too much. They have a very short lifespan, though. They only live about two to three years, which is kind of surprising considering how large an animal they are. But they do have quite a short lifespan. OK. Oh, good idea. There you go, bullseye. This is one of our real favorites. This is Gidget. Gidget is an English Angora rabbit. She is raised for fur, basically. However, with this kind of animal, they do not have to kill it to get the fur. They just can basically pull it out. It comes out quite easily. So they pull it out or they brush it out. And they can do that about every 10 weeks and harvest quite a bit of fur from these guys. Now, the sweater I have on is part Angora. You can see what a soft look it gives to a sweater. It's very expensive, though. One skein of yarn is worth about $80 if it's totally Angora wool. So a sweater this size would be worth about $300, $400 if it was pure Angora. These rabbits would not be found in the wild. They are bred just for their fur. There is also, there's your ears, ha. <laughs> there's also a French Angora rabbit. It has a bare face, but it also has the long fur as the English Angora has. These animals make really nice pets. They're very, very friendly as rabbits go. This one runs loose in our lab and our museum all the time, and the students are just crazy about him. They pet him all the time, and everybody comes to visit him after they graduate. The only problem with them is you have to brush them continuously because they do shed and they get matted very fast. They're very hard to clip. It's hard to clip this fur because it's so dense that uh, it burns out your clippers, and they have to be sharpened after each rabbit. So it's pretty hard to find a groomer that'll do it. And their skin is so tender that if you try to cut it with scissors, you have to be very careful because it's very easy to nick them and hurt them. Anyway, that's Gidget. Oh, yeah, let's put, it, put them up on the table. I'm going to be a coward and wear a glove for this one. This is Ursula. Ursula is a green, a common green iguana. This iguana would be found around Mexico, South America, Central America. Fairly common down there. He's not quite full grown. They can get to be six feet long. About two thirds of that would be their tail. You can see his tail is striped up to here, and then it stops. Like other lizards, these can lose their tails. He's lost it and regrown it. These guys have very sharp claws. That's why I'm wearing the glove. This is really a very friendly iguana, but he wants to hold on to me. Hi, sorry. And when he holds on, it uh, causes him to claw a little bit. An iguana's main defense, though, is to whip with this tail. They can whip really hard with it and be quite treacherous. So if, if they aren't tamed when they're young, they can be very hard to handle when they're older. Now this guy is a kind of a primitive animal. I don't know if you can see right here, he's got a third eye. Some of your reptiles have this. It's um, not really functional anymore. At one time they were probably used to catch either the light or the shadow. On the side here, he's got a tympanic membrane. That's his ear. That's where he hears. Reptiles are cold-blooded animals. That means that they don't produce their own heat. 
in order to keep your reptile pets in good condition, you really need to keep them warm enough, like about 80 degrees or so. A good way to do that is to use a product that it, it looks like a brick. You can buy them in pet stores and you plug them in and they warm to a certain body temperature. That way it keeps your animal warm enough. If you have a snake or an iguana or something like that and you don't keep it warm enough, then they will not eat and then of course they'll die. A lot of people like to give an animal like this. This is a vegetarian and he, he's an herbivore it's called. He only eats vegetables. He's not a meat eater. So a lot of people with an animal like that will just feed them lettuce. Lettuce is pretty useless in terms of nutrition for animals. It doesn't have very many calories. It doesn't have very much nutrition. Something like spinach is much better. Also, we give them a lot of fruits and vegetables. And we add frozen vegetables because that's very easy to keep on hand, like the frozen mixed vegetables, peas and carrots and corn and lima beans. And he seems to do quite well on that. Also, vitamins in the diet are important. Okay. Um, these do make pretty good pets. They're fairly easy to come by small. You can't find them large very often. Some of these pets, when they get large, especially like the boa constrictor, make very bad pets. This boa constrictor, I now have a rule that only, um, we can only get her out if there's two people to handle her because she's large enough that she could hurt somebody. Okay, if you get a pet boa constrictor and it's little, you don't seem to, a lot of people don't realize that they're going to get big and then they're very hard to get rid of. I'm always getting calls at the museum of people that want to give me large snakes. Nobody wants large snakes, so that might be something to consider if you're thinking of getting a pet snake. Some of the ones that stay small might be more appropriate. Oh, yeah. Okay, I've got one more animal here to show you. If I can get him out of his cage here. Yeah, you can take that. This one's been making a real mess in here. Let's move this out of the way. I have to come over this way. Arthur armadillo. Armadillos are really amazing animals. <laughs> I'll move him. Help. They have sharp claws, which they use for digging. I'm going to put some worms out here for them, see if we can get them to eat. Their reflex is to jump. Here. Mmm. Armadillos are insect eaters. They have very small teeth. Uh, they were not in the United States prior to the 1850s, except in primitive times. There were giant anteaters, or armadillos, that weighed about 100 pounds that were in this area until about five or 10,000 years ago. At that time, they became extinct. Around the 1850s, when the native cats and things had been wiped out pretty much, the armadillos started moving north from Mexico into the United States. Uh, since that time, they have spread through Texas, Louisiana, all the way over to Florida, as far north as the border of Kansas. They really have very few natural enemies, except the automobile. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, the automobile is a problem because their startle reflex is to jump. So if a car goes over them, even if the wheels don't hit them, they jump and it kills them. That's why there's so many dead ones on the road in Texas and areas like that. Uh, this is a very important animal for medical research now. The um, lep leprosy will grow in these armadillos and it will not grow in any other animal. So for leprosy research, they have really been invaluable. They have allowed the production of a chemical that is used to determine the prognosis, how bad leprosy will be in patients. And now, for the first time, they're starting to develop a leprosy vaccine that will be tested soon. 
Uh, there's still about 12 to 13 million people in the world that have leprosy, so this is a very valuable thing. Okay, I think we're about out of time. So I'd like to thank you for watching our show and hope you come visit us in the museum sometime at Golden West College. It's in the Math Science Building, room 114. We also can arrange group tours and we have a limited number of tours that can go out to schools. So give us a call sometime. Thank you.